do not aim to be a billionaire. Although I'm a startup entrepreneur, I don't really like startups per se as a, as a career path. I think it's a very overhyped, oversold proposal. We, we got the sort of Finnish billionaire mafia, as they call it, to invest. And then we raised uh, 30 million round and the 100 or so million round. And now, uh, just recently, another 100 million. But try scaling a chair that has three legs and all of those three need to grow at the same rate. And that's the tricky part. That ended up shipping 13 million copies, which is still more, as, as you mentioned, than, than Vault has ever shipped. So it's obviously a more successful application than Vault is. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a fact. And at some point, yeah, it was on around 10% of all the iPhones in the world. Hello, Elias. How are you doing? How is the metro in, in Espo? That's the new thing there. Hey, Petri. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, oh, God. The subway. Um, yeah, don't ask me about that. I'm I'm a notorious uh, enemy of the Espo subway, but it's I pretty mean, good out here. Um, the sun is shining. Is actually turning out to be a summery day. Some years back, there was a person who asked you to have a cup of coffee, mm-hmm. and it kind of changed your life. C- can you say what was the sales pitch? What happened when Mickey Kuusi? offered you, I don't know whether he paid the cup of coffee, but... He's a stingy bastard. He probably didn't. I, I think uh, I think we paid our own. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, so, Mickey, who I had met, met in passing once and said, hello, and he probably waved back and probably didn't say a thing, um, called me up. And Mickey was um, the CEO of Slush at that point. Um, called me up and said, you know, let's have a cup of coffee. And I was excited. Um, Though, like, because I I had my company dealing with um, um, software consultancy, but we were sort of detached from the whole startup scene. Um, We were not, although we were entrepreneurs and whatnot in the tech field, there was a great big divide between the startups who were like seeking explosive growth and us boring companies. Um, so it was very interesting to sort of sit with Mickey and have a chat. And um, his pitch was that we sit down in the in in the cafe, and he's like, "Oh, look at the look at the massive queue." And I'm like, "There's no massive queue. It's Corona season." Um, no, it actually wasn't Corona season back then, and there was a queue. And uh, yeah, and he was like, "Oh, wouldn't it be cool if we were sitting down here at the table and we could like." continue discussion while making the order and just picking it up from um, from the cashier's desk when it's ready and have all the payment and whatnot done. And I was like, yeah, uh, that would be cool. And I think it would be sort of um, of good utility. Um, and I have been thinking of a similar thing and actually building um, a sort of a similar thing before. So yeah. That's that's how it started for me with the story of Bolt, um, which is nowadays mostly known for its uh, delivery service of, of restaurant food. Um, but yeah, so I, I think the whole actual idea was that there is this sort of time and space where you have to be in the same time and space as another person, which is in this case the cashier, to place the order to communicate and to make the payment. So there were two of these steps that we could detach from from the so sort of the time and space continuum, um, the payment and, and the ordering process. Um, now, we then later detach the third part, which is the, 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 the sort of the consumption. So you don't, you, you, you don't even actually have to consume in the same space, uh, which really exploded the business. But at that point, it was just detaching those two and I read somewhere that you you figured out rather early on that you know there's actually no queues in cafes in in Helsinki. So you know, well, there are queues. Different. There are queues in in many places now. But the difficulty in sort of because we were doing eating in and and takeaway. Now, um, like it can work, and it still does. There's there's like um, not a trivial amount. It's I think double digits small, small double digits percentages of uh, of all the vault orders are actually takeaway uh, orders and not not delivery orders. Um, 
it works. But the problem is it doesn't work the first time. Now, like going up to the cashier and making placing an order and paying for the order um, is actually better than, you know, downloading an application, registering your, the application, verifying your phone number, verifying your email address, entering a credit card, learning to use an application, placing the order. Um, so the amount of steps that you sort of have to do to make place the first order um, is worse than the old way of doing it. Or in the case of takeaway orders, just calling the goddamn place. Um, it's it's a lot simpler to call and say, you know, give me that pizza. I'm going to come and pick it up and pay by credit card. It's it's a lot quicker. Um, so the issue with, with the... Um, with the concept initially was that the first time use case is actually worse than the status quo and and you only get the value from the second and third and fourth and fifth and you catch up by like third order but you know it just won't grow fast enough and also um, it doesn't provide you with anything exclusive and that's a really that's that was the real kicker um, because like you could order, from the till and just walk up to the the person queue if you must that's fine uh, or you could call them so like we didn't provide a, a new service that didn't exist in a way you could get the same service now with delivery we provide something that you couldn't get before it's exclusive to to our application of course there may be now other providers of that but it's it's compared to the sort of status quo of of, of that restaurant existing um you couldn't get delivery from them um so that exclusive content and that's like you know that's why uh hbo has game of thrones and and that's the reason why you choose game of thrones is is the exclusive stuff uh, everybody has some of this sort of catalog stuff and um but but the exclusiveness of walt came from delivery compared to the, the usual restaurant use case can you recall some moments where you were like struggling to get some kind of attraction going and and, and then you've yeah, so like for for like now it's happening. Now it's happening. You know, now now yeah. I don't know what. No. Oh, it's did, did you actually know what was happening? Why it was happening? Yeah, well, there's definitely that moment when we realized, sort of like it's working, and and it's when when like everything breaks down, and and your company is about to be ripped in ten pieces. Um, like for the first year, um, so we start building the the service in early two thousand and fourteen. Uh, we incorporate the company in late 2014, and then we launched the the application in, I'd say, February 2015, I think. Um, and from that spring, throughout the summer, we're seeing growth. Um, it's slow, but we're seeing growth. And um, at that point, we're thinking, well, what should we sort of do to, you know, get the ball really rolling because this is growing, but it's not growing fast enough. And we're thinking different kind of concepts. We're like, well, where where does the queue thing really annoy you? Well, for example, nightclubs, it might annoy you. These days, we don't remember what nightclubs are, but they used to be places where you go and get drunk um, and you're close to other people. Um, and, and so, you know, they used to have a lot of queuing and you're like, well, Maybe it's the alcohol because alcohol gets, has a good margin. We can uh, charge a good commission, and you can skip the queue and get some exclusive perks if you use the application and whatnot. So we were exploring that. And the other case was like, well, what about like sports arenas? Because like during the the halftime break, there's a big queue in sports arenas to get the food and, and also the drinks. Um, and so we were contemplating that, and we got some offers, and you know, maybe we should. You know, really concentrate on the sports arenas. But then we're like, well, the problem is that, you know, even if you take all the sports arenas, even if you take all the nightclubs and bars, uh, the the volume just isn't there. Uh, we really need to target food. So we we actually tried the nightclubs a little bit, and it gave a, a reasonable bump into sales. And we're like, mm, that's it's tempting to really go all in there, but it's just not enough of a business case. And we we shied away from that. Um, and then Fudora came to Helsinki, which was our first city. And um, and they were offering delivery. And we were like, oh, crap. Um, 
now we got to do delivery because we, we of course like from the very beginning we were planning on doing delivery which is we're hoping that someone else does the actual delivery part the the, the sort of messy logistics whereas we figured we are only a software company and we don't have to deal with the sort of horrible thing where you know have thousands of people delivering your stuff and it's like very complicated humans Oof. we nurse we don't like that so um then we started to like realize that we have to start our own delivery service and, and in, a, in a couple of weeks we we did and when we did uh that was the moment when we realized holy shit it's working um so that uh autumn i think we launched the delivery in uh august 2015 um but then september october november we were growing 20 30 percent week over week for the whole autumn and um yeah when you're doubling as a company uh every two and a half three weeks uh it's <laughs> it's, it's difficult um because um you just piling on new people mostly of course to the sort of logistics part but but also then you're like oh our tech can't handle this growth and whatnot um so yeah that was that was the moment we realized oh this there's actually something in this um this is actually probably the uh, the concept that we want to explore further you were all involved with uh, at least one of the things you were doing was the design of the first mobile app can you describe how that happened and you know where there's some interesting moments yeah so um out of the the founders i was the, the product lead and also the um i developed the the ios application which was our first a consumer platform uh, and then the ios application for the restaurants uh, so yeah uh, it's interesting because we really didn't have any experience with the the restaurant industry. Um, one of us, I think, Oscar, who was a back end engineer, or who still is, um, had worked one summer at a McDonald's, so we were practically <laughs> professionals. Um, so, but we knew how to we how we would want to order food, and and this is a this is a thing where, like. Some people have asked me to help design some concept, and I'm like, "Yeah, but that's hard. <laughs> that's a hard concept because I've always done easy ones because it's semi-trivial." You know, I'm first to admit it. It's like making a food delivery application um, is quite an easy thing to design and build. I mean, it's it's hard to do it, of course, well. Like, but the the gist of it is, you know, you pick a restaurant. You pick the food, you pick where you want it, and you pay it, and then you know you somehow get notifications where, where what's happening, and then you get your food. Now there's like, because some, someone has been building like an app for solving um, marital issues, and you're like, well, how do you even start? I have no idea how to solve my own marriage without an application. How, how like how do you fix it with an app, um, or how do you fix depression with an app? Like I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if it's possible. Whereas it's definitely possible, and it's quite easy to start designing an app for for ordering food. So um, now, so the so the trivial thing is is trivial. Now, what what we probably did a bit different is that we are, or I'm personally obsessed with with sort of details and 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 making um, the UIs just very fine tuned and and smooth and nicely animated and and just not cutting corners in terms of the the experience that the user gets um but that was for the consumer application is easy because we were very in the very much in the target market um and you know there were existing products and and you could sort of benchmark those a little bit and, and then just make the sort of next generation thing uh, we didn't have the luxury that you know you would have now where you sort of we've seen copies of basically direct copies of vault in some markets um and uh and of course now there's uber eats and food and and delivery and whatnot 
back then, well, Uber Eats didn't exist. Delivery did exist, but we didn't know they existed because they were just a local player in in UK at that point. Um, initially, we didn't know that Foodora existed. We we were actually sort of thought we were up against basically Pizza Online, which was um, back then very web focused and, and sort of the early two thousands kind of product. Um, so we we thought we were we thought we were basically alone in the market and nobody else had done a mobile first uh, company for for ordering food. We were quite wrong with that assessment, but you know, worked out. Oh, also, by the way, I have to mention uh, the restaurant application because, well, we had never worked in a restaurant. So making an application for, for restaurants to manage the order flow, that was a bit in interesting. So I just basically um, drew a mock-up of, like, you know, you would have the incoming orders there and the outgoing orders there. And, you know, then our designer, co-founder, Mika, made the final graphics. And um, then I developed it. And turns out the same app was essentially used up until this year. And now we replaced it finally with, with a new one, which still uses the same design. And funnily enough, that design is completely different from um, the, the competition. It's very, very different. Um, and you would think that there's basically only one way to do that. But no, actually, that part is quite unique to Volt, how, how the restaurants manage their orders. But it seems to be that the, the restaurants like it. Um, so that's good. Apparently, we just are our natural geniuses in, in designing restaurant software. Or, yeah, I, I think it's it's good enough. Now, the what we did there as well was that we approached the, the, that software as basically a consumer software. So because usually all the software that, um, that companies get looks disgusting and is horrible. Um, but it's very powerful. You can do a lot of things, but it's just, you know, a gazillion different buttons and, and you have to know the magic spells to sort of use that. Um, but we want to make it very intuitive and very consumer-like with, with nice animations and, and, and smoothness, but still efficient so you wouldn't get annoyed by it being slow. Um, when you process your, like, let's say, your um, millionth order, um, we don't want to get in the way um, of you using the application, so it cannot be like overly visual and and and, and um, extra eye candy for the sake of eye candy. But it's it's very nice. It was a very nice application from the very beginning. Uh, very sort of up to a high standard of of uh, production value, and I think that made it stood out because a lot of people just throw in a the sort of crappiest web form to be used by the. Um, by the non-consumer, but we really put effort into that app as well. Was that the conscious choice by you know the founding team, or was it your idea? Or, you know, how, how did that came about? Well, the, from the very beginning, from our first meeting with Mickey, is we've been very aligned with Mickey on sort of the um, sort of a vision of of not cutting corners in terms of the user experience um, in any any part of the. The service, so we are both very obsessed with um, rather doing it a bit too well and risking um, using too much time and and over engineering the experience. Um, so I mean, Mickey had a brief stint at um, at Supercell, which is also I think a company that really excels in making things not just like. Uh, like a great game, the mechanics, or great monetization, but also like very fine-tuned and, and beautiful apps throughout. Um, and, and so we were very aligned on that. Of course, like then our back-end engineers were, weren't as interested <laughs> in, in how it all looks. Um, so I have to say, even like from, from the original founding team, so we had two uh, back-end um, developers, uh, Lauri and Oscar. Uh, now, Lauri has since actually built our Android application as well, and and he went that that initial Android application was one of the the coolest Android apps I think that I've I've used. Um, uh, and because uh, it was it was five years ago, 
you know, the standard was a bit different back then. Um, it was a, it was a cool app. Um, and so like we also had apparently backend engineers who were, who were building beautiful things. So I, I, I would say it's actually, um, uh, it was, um, sort of founding team wide thing that we really wanted to, to push the, uh, the level of user experience throughout. Walt is in a traditional chicken and egg business in a sense that you need to get the restaurants in there and, and then you need to get the crowd and, and, you know, sort of keep this in balance. No, so we are not in a chicken and egg. <laughs> we, we're, there, there's also, we, we have the third part. I don't know what that is. Um, the omelets. You need the roosters as well, man. Um, so, because it's a, it's a three-sided market, three-sided marketplace. Um, so, a traditional marketplace where there's two sides. It's, annoying enough to grow that but try scaling a le- like a, a chair that has three legs and all of those three need to um, grow at the same rate and that's the tricky part so so you need to have the restaurant supply the, the customer demand but also the courier supply um, so if any of those goes like is is too low the whole thing collapses so if there's not enough demand well, then the restaurants are like, well, we're not getting enough orders. And, and the couriers are like, well, we're not getting enough gigs. We're going to quit the platform because we can make a living. Um, and then, well, if there's too much demand, well, then the experience sucks because it takes two hours to get any food. Um, so it's a very fine balance. And it's actually like, it's crazy how fine that balance is. If you're off by like 10% at some point, like couriers, you down 10%, it's it's horrible. Um, so all the kudos in the world to the sort of operational teams on on managing that that balance so that we we have the right. I think the the easiest one is perhaps the restaurants because um, in some sense, the restaurants don't really care. Now, of course, they do care about it, but like if there's an iPad in the corner and no orders come in, well, then no orders come in, but it's not going to sort of ruin their day because uh, initially, at least, the majority of their business is still their own business. They're all old, you know, whether it's eating in or selling takeaway from the counter, that's their main business still. This is a sort of supplement initially. Um, so if the supplement doesn't, you know, bring in tens of orders a day, who cares? It's just an iPad sitting there and it's quiet. So I think that is the easiest part to flex but then man if there's not enough demand for the couriers to be online or there's too much demand and not enough couriers online those both really suck for the user or the courier um so it's it's a tricky issue um growing that business for sure how how did you manage that one did you have some artificial intelligence machine learning or thumb of the rules so you know what what was the trick to to you know because you were also growing you know, rapidly. So it was like that you, you you can just, you know, learn what's happening. But, you know, there's also this variable which is probably exponential. I don't think there's a, a, an artificial intelligence that can, you know, hire you a thousand courier partners <laughs> when, when need be. Um, yeah, we are actually, it's, it's funny now that you mention artificial intelligence, because we basically used none of that for the first four years in the company. Um, and people were like, oh, you're probably doing your root optimization with artificial intelligence. We're like, uh, no, um, it's it's a traveling salesman problem that is a dynamic version of it. It's it's like a horrible NP-complete computer in like calculation-intensive pro- problem and you want to sort of combine that with another brute force computer computing power intensive solution like AI, you know, God help you with that. Um, but no, um, I think it was, there was this, some of the, the ops people um, at the worst moments of growth, the best moments for the company, but worst moments for sort of part i think they just they worked crazy hours and they pushed through it um it's like when you're growing at that point when we're growing those 20 30 percent a week or a week and you just have to like do a magic trick month in month out every time double the company and and the operations and then try to sort of not only 
get the people in, but then also sort of rebuild the organization structure like all the time because you're growing so fast. Um, I don't know if there's a sort of an easy way through it. They just they just did it because um, it had to be done. It's it's insane. Um, the growth has been more relaxed in terms of like the 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 product side. I think we now have like hundred and I don't know what the exact count is. Hundred and thirty people working on the product. Hundred and forty. Um, but it's been now six years, and we started with with four. So yeah, it's it's a big, big increase, but it's not. You know, it doesn't double every week, uh, every every month. Um, so that's been more relaxed. Although even in that, of course, there's a lot of growth pain um, and a lot of restructuring. Many times, learning a new sort of model of working. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's any magic trick to it. How to grow? It's always going to be different and and and, and tricky uh, to get to get your company to grow like that. How was the money money side? You know, getting funding in different environments. You were also coming from Finland, and you know your rounds mm-hmm. were quite. A, you know, you, you needed quite a lot of capital as well. Was that easy? You know, with the support you were having and, and the connections. You know, and also with the slush and yeah, and, and Ilka Kivimäki and all these. So you know, can can you elaborate a bit what happened in that front? Sure. Um, now that was actually probably the the number one reason. So we we why things got a bit delayed in the beginning. So we met with Mickey for the coffee in um, in February 2014. But the company was actually founded and incorporated. Um, I think it's October 2014. So there was over half a year between um, us actually starting to code the product and the company actually being founded. Um, and that was mostly due to the funding. Funding. Now, Mickey was at that point very already very um, known in the in the industry, and he was the CEO of Slush. So, like you could say, a celebrity in the in the startup scene. And now, does that help getting funding? Yes, it does. It of course opens a lot of doors. Mickey knew basically all the relevant key players in the industry. Um, because they all were, you know, part of the the slush ecosystem as well. But um, so so we knew from the very beginning that Mickey was instrumental in getting the funding. Of course, like I had a, a company before, and and um, I had a, a successful game uh, on the iOS before. But still, I knew none of the people. I was not in the startup seen at all uh, so i didn't know any of the uh, of the vcs or angel investors and whatnot i mean we pr- probably could have raised with the the rest of the team as well but it was really hinged on mickey mickey's connection mickey's sort of star power to to pull in the investment um now but mickey was was still the ceo of slush and it's very hard to sort of give away that um give away your sort of because it's a, it's a it's a very nice spot to be the CEO of Slush. It doesn't pay you, but it it is a powerful position. And so, I think Mickey was struggling a bit internally on whether to actually commit to found, found, founding Vault or sticking with Slush or finding a, a sort of a better concept to pursue. Um, so it it almost didn't happen. I think in um, we, we got the first. Uh, demo of the application, the proof, first proof of concept, we had the first uh, cafe we used it in. And Mickey was like, oh, it's kind of cool. But I don't know. I don't know. I was like, Mickey, come on. Um, <laughs> all of us have quit our jobs. Um, I've quit my <laughs> own company. And I've, I've actually, because of that, had to give in away a, par- a large chunk of my ownership in that company. So like, I'm in this. And you better fucking be in this as well. <laughs> and and uh, so we finally pushed Mickey to sort of commit to it. And then after when he when he decided that okay, finally stood, then I would say it was um, unfairly easy to get the funding. It still wasn't like a complete walk in the park because our concept was a, a naming and everything was a bit off at that point. 
And no one really believed in the takeaway business or the, the eating in business. And rightfully so, because turns out that doesn't grow fast enough. It's not a VC fundable really thing. Um, so, but we, we got it in the end, the, the first uh, sort of angel round um, of 400 and later it turned out to be 450,000 euros. Um, so it was, you know, somewhat easy. I think where where the, the uh, Mickey's influence really came in was was the sort of quality of the investors. So we had uh, we had Ilka Paranen, uh personally be involved. Then we had Risto Silasma and like Petri Koponen was not that at that point actually really involved. He he's currently the chairman of the board, but. The, although Lifeline Inventures made the investment, it was more through Ilka Panen and not, not so much Petri Koponen. He actually <laughs> sort of turned us down initially and then Panen sort of said, well, I think we should invest. And then, then it happened through Lifeline. But Koponen was a bit hesitant actually initially um, to, to invest in our, in our company. So like I, I say we, we got the sort of Finnish billionaire mafia, as they call it, um, to to invest that that was the the main influence of the first round from from Mickey Star Power. I think we probably could have got, gotten close to the same valuation and, and amount of money but just from a different tier of uh, of investors. Uh, and of course the the lead investor being um Inventure which was a, also a a fine company. Now the later rounds so we first got that round in uh and then the company really didn't really grow during the take takeaway era, and then we got the deliver, delivery part. Um, so we, we got a lot of explosive growth in the in the fall of 2015. Now the problem with the growth was the the business didn't work at all. Um, so it was so inefficient uh, from a software and then the operations point of view that there was no business in in the delivery at that point. Uh, so we were losing a lot of money on the delivery. But it was growing a lot, um, but you know, at, at some point, it's okay just to, to grow a lot. <laughs> and so, um, during the fall, we we're running out of money, and we we're basically running into a wall. In like, we we have like a month left of runway. Um, but before that, we couldn't raise because we didn't have any numbers to back up. We didn't even have any growth to back up thing our sort of pitch to investors. So at, at least we got the growth, and um, at that point, we raised around from our existing investors, which is never a, a place you want to be in, right? Because you want competition uh, to, to to sort of drive up the price. But we had to go back to our uh, own investors and say, you know, we need a little bit of more money. Uh, so we raised $2 million from our existing investors. Um, and then just a couple of months later, um, the growth continues and it's doing nicely and... and, uh, and we, we come up with a way to sort of see how the business could look like if if all of these parameters would change sort of our efficiency numbers and our um, cost per here and, and, and those things. So we, we managed to pull off um, an Excel that looked like a business. <laughs> and and <laughs> the, like the, 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 there could be a business and it's currently growing like 20% a week. And so that started to look up a lot more enticing and now that we had the money and we weren't um in a situation where we need the money next week or we're going to go bust now we could uh, negotiate and so, so then a couple of months later after the two million round we actually started negotiating a 10 million round um and so and that was a, a competed round we had an acquisition offer and we had that investment and we played those against each other, and we ended up with the ten million from uh, led by EQT Ventures, and um, that was, I think that that is the best round we have ever raised in terms of like um, where the the company actually was, and what price we got for it, because the first round um, like these days a lot of the companies are raising these two million pre money valuations. And well, we had the CEO of Slush, goddammit, and we had six co-founders. And and people think, well, six co-founders is a bit much. Yeah, sure, it is a bit much. I think it's not in any shape or form the optimal number. 
But for an investment point of view, you get six co-founders working for you for for basically like slave labor level salaries because um, the the founder salaries are, of course, very meager because you don't want to burn the cash. But you got six very committed people working for you um, for a low salary. Um, that's a great deal from an investment point of view. So I think our angel round wasn't particularly great in terms of valuation. The, the two million round wasn't great because we were, um, you know, backed into a corner. We just had to take money in no matter what the terms were. And the terms were fine. Um, I mean, our investors didn't really hose us. They could have hosted, hosted, hosted us way worse if they wanted to because we had to take the money. But the 10 million around, we actually were very successful in actually selling the company, selling a vision, selling something we didn't have at that moment. Um, so that was that was great. What happens when you raise a good round, though, is a is a hung uh, you get a, a, a nasty ha- hangover because now you have to actually make those numbers work and uh, that's a different thing right so uh, by the time you raise the next round you need to you need an up round I mean nobody ever wants to raise a down round um, so you need to actually make that growth and then you need to make some more growth um, to sort of sell the higher valuation so that was when when it got tricky we were growing nicely but to catch up to the to the hype that we and you know were able to sell the previous time the next round of funding was a lot more difficult um, but uh, yeah and then we raised uh, 30 million round and the 100 or so million round and now uh, just recently another 100 million so it's it's gone nicely um actually between those uh, 10 and 30 million round we we were struggling a little bit but but then we really uh, got our stride in and 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 sort of learned how to scale the business and and now it's uh, you know it's it's a controlled chaos explosion but at least now it's sort of going in the direction as as that that it's a predictable direction really and how it's working even though Walt is amazing success already by now, you did something before that, which is in some um, you know numbers by downloads even more impressive. Ten percent of all the iPhones in the market globally were using something you did. Yeah, obviously that's that's that we, <laughs> we only measure things by downloads. That's the 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 real metric. Um, I wish it were so. Um, yeah, so. In the very early days of, of uh, App Store, um, I happened to get on board developing for for iPhone OS, as it was called back then. It wasn't even the iOS. Um, so I actually started developing for iOS in 2008. Um, the App Store had launched that summer, and then I started developing um, in the fall, launched my first game. Why did game. you start? Why did I start? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Um, like, we had been a weirdo family for a long time. So everybody and their like dog had a PC, uh, an IBM, like first a DOS and then a Windows PC. Like, sure, there were some Commodores and, and some Amigas, you know, previously, but by the sort of mid-90s and later, at least... And my social sphere was dominated by by um, by Windows PCs, um, but we had a Mac. Uh, so my mom had bought a Mac, I think in '95, a Performa 6300, and uh, it, it was horrible in terms of gaming because, like, it didn't have any of the games that everybody else was playing, and yeah. But we always had Macs. You know, for better or worse, we had Macs, and I uh, obviously like. I'm, I'm nowadays I'm still a Mac user, so like I think it's good. But it wasn't good growing up because everybody had all the cool games, and you didn't have those. So you know, it's so socially tricky to have a Mac growing up. Um, but <laughs> so we, we we were a Mac family from mid '90s, um, and then I was t- actually working as a as a as a Flash you know, developer for for Digia, making UI prototypes with Flash. 
And I was never a really a real programmer. My my sort of programming background actually started in um, in the university. I did two courses of of programming: the basics of Java and the basics of C plus plus. That's my that's my academic background into programming. And um, yeah, I started programming in, in, in uh, for 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 Flash. Um, and um, and then iPhone came out, and then actually one of my brothers was like, "Oh, you know, the iPhone form factor is very close to what a Piazza machine is." And you're like, "If you're listening from an, a country not Finland, you're like, what the hell is a Piazza machine?" Well, it's this weird coin game that is basically exclusive to Finland, uh, but every Finnish person knows what it is. Um, and so, because of the acceler- accelerometer on the on the iPhone. He figured that you could sort of smack the phone and get the same effect as as playing a payazzo, and I was like, "Well, you know, might as well see if I can do it." And so I I just picked up the developer kit, the Xcode, and I started trying. Looked at some tutorials that that Apple provided, and then just went on from there. And so I learned the platform on my own. Actually, the games I built were mostly done with OpenGL. I had done a little bit of OpenGL for my C++ course, so I wasn't completely new to it, but basically super new because, <laughs> yeah, I did it all wrong nowadays looking back. Um, it was technically super wrong how I, I used OpenGL, but it's fine. It worked, and, and the user didn't know. Um, but yeah, so I built the Payazzo thing, and it was a great success in Finland because... Nobody outside of Finland knows knows what a payazzo is, but in Finland everybody knows what it is, and then so um, it was the number one game in the Finnish App Store for what twelve weeks or something continuously. I think it's still like the longest running um, uh, top one app that was continuously on number one position, um, but it because iPhone was very small in Finland um, back then. The I think it sold at most like sixty to seventy copies a day, and it was at that point priced I think at one or two dollars. So I made like seventy euro in a single day, and I was like, "Oh, this is awesome! This is great!" Um, now at that point, I figured, well. You probably should make a game that people know what it is, and or can sort of get the understanding. So, so I start toying with with an idea of making this um, stereoscopic game, where when you tilt the phone, the scene within the phone changes, so it looks like you're looking into a three D object. Um, and I had seen that done with the Nintendo Wii at that point, something called head tracking. And so I figured that I'd build a demo out of this idea, and the demo just happened to be this labyrinth game, um, because there was a, a labyrinth game that was very well known on the iOS App Store at that point. And I just made the, the demo with that. I was like, "Well, this is actually pretty good, and I should probably make the whole game uh, just with this." And I'm like, "Well, but it's kind of wrong because there already is this game. This is basically just a copy with the 3D element to it." I was like, well, but this is so close to it. So I just spent another month making it into an actual game, and then I was launching. And I was like, mm, should I, should I like make this free because it's a, it's a copy of an existing. It's, it's a flat out plagiarized copy. I mean, I mean, I didn't copy actual assets, but it's just the same game essentially. I was like, oh well, you know, maybe I should still ask a little bit of money for it just to be sure, and. Yeah, so in the end, it generated around half a million euros of revenue through sales of the game and some some ads and some some awards. It won like a through a different a, a port of it won a hundred thousand dollars from from Nokia, which is crazy. Um, but anyway, I made a free version later, uh, like a light version. Um, and that ended up shipping 13 million copies, which is still more 
as, as you mentioned, than, than Vault has ever shipped. So it's obviously a more successful application than Vault is. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a fact. Um, and at some point, yeah, it was on around 10% of all the iPhones in the world. It's insane how many hours of time has been wasted on that game. Um, it's, I unfortunately didn't have sort of analytics during this sort of heyday, but, uh, but later when I added analytics to it and, and sort of based on the download counts later, it's, it's thousands of, it was, I think it was like over a thousand years of like working hours has been spent on it. It's, oh, it's insane. Um, I'm sorry, uh, global economy. I, I robbed people from doing actual stuff. But it, it was also one of the sort of key drivers in, in founding Vault because when you make your own product, there's quite nothing like the, the high you get from the sort of user feedback and, and having a lot of people uh, use your your baby, you know, your thing that you build with, build with passion. Um, so, like, the, it's it's funny. Um, even a small game like that, you would I would I would get like tens of emails where people were like, "Oh, I I love playing this game with my with my boy," you know, doing weekends in our bed, and we just play this together, and it's awesome. You're like, wow. Um, so, and and thirteen million is such a massive, crazy, strange number, and that's that's the power of App Store, really. Because uh, I didn't never did any marketing because I couldn't afford any marketing, right? Any meaningful marketing. The only marketing was that the app was good and, and it was approachable and, and it just worked on its own. Um, but you can reach such a crazy amount of people. Uh, of course, nowadays it's it's a lot harder because the, the competition uh, on the App Store is, is crazy. Um, back then it was a lot easier to sort of have your one-man show kind of product actually work out and... Nowadays, it's mostly driven through performance marketing, right? This, the success stories on the App Store are very algorithmic and um, very much like, of course, you first need a good product, but then you need a lot of expertise in, in turning that into a successful business by pumping hundreds of millions into marketing it and making sure that you that the game is actually monetizing well enough to to support that. It's it's a strange business model. Um, now, like, of course, there are still these viral hits, but, uh, you know, they are less and less that and more it's this sort of business around it. Back then, there really was no business. It was more like uh, small companies and individuals building something and then just they happened to work. It was a more innocent time back then. Until in-app purchases ruined everything. In-app purchases are disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then there was a moment as well where you were waking up one morning and reading the news and you were supposed to be somewhere far away in California and you were just stuck in Espo. Yeah, that, that was that was annoying. So um, I think that was 2010. It had to have been. I should probably check. Um, so um, Wooden Labyrinth 3D which was the Labyrinth game. Um, back then, you still had to nominate um, apps and games for Apple Design Awards. So Apple Design Awards are the yearly awards given by Apple for sort of the best apps in different categories. Now, I had put my my game up for sort of... I had nominated it, um, but I had, hadn't think anything about it because... Obviously, there were still, even at that point, thousands and thousands of apps. And um, yeah, and then the WWDC, the Worldwide Developer Conference, happened where the awards are given. And then I'm reading like in Gadget or something. And there are the winners. Uh, and my game is there. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. So the awards ceremony had happened. Um there was actually a video. I, I don't know if it still exists. It was on YouTube. A video of the award ceremony of that year, and all the other winners are present in the in the gala, and they go on stage and you know have their little moment. And then the video doesn't have my game because 
I didn't know I was going to win. So I wasn't at the WWDC. Um, and so they just skip my award completely. I guess they knew I wasn't there or, you know, they just called, you know, Elias, come on stage. And it was awkward because no one showed up. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, one of the perks of the winning it would have been that if you were there, they would have refunded your travel and your uh, a conference ticket. Damn, <laughs> but it's fine. It was, it's still, it's the coolest trophy still. Um, it's this anodized uh, aluminum cube that if you touch it, uh, the Apple logo illuminates on the top. So it's, it's, it's very special. Um, but yeah, it would have been even more special to actually be there in person to, to pick it up. You know, I, I, I don't know if like, back then Steve was still, still around. I don't know if he actually attended that part of the conference probably not but but at least like the all the ios you know heavyweights um are there too so maybe you could have shaken some hands but um uh, yeah i later got an email from from apple that you know congratulations for your win here you know here's how to claim your prize um which in and of itself was tricky because they tried to ship me a, a laptop with a American keyboard when I wanted to finish one. They said, we don't have any Finnish keyboards. And I was like, well, do you have any Swedish keyboards? Hint, they are the same. And they were like, oh, we have Swedish keyboards. I'm like, yeah, um, just ship me one of those. Um, so I got my, my laptop and my display. And I, and I did get a free ticket for the next year's WWDC. And so that was the actually the only time I've ever went there. Um, so... Yeah, uh, that was, I, I rank that way higher than the sort of Nokia prize that gave you a lot of money, but like who cares about a Nokia prize when you can win the Apple Design Award? I think how, that was... How did you get a no Nokia prize if you were having, you know, iPhone app? Well, because we ported it. Uh, so Nokia, okay. Nokia contacted us and said, you know, that's an awesome game. We want it on Nokia. And I was like, okay. Uh, and they paid uh, like 30,000 or something uh, to have it ported. And then we did a port at Quick. Um, so our mobile consulting company, one of our developers, Berti, just picked up and we like, okay, we were like, you do it. <laughs> he hates the pro He has still nightmares and like post-traumatic stress order from that project. It was horrible. Uh, so he ported it to Symbian 3. And um, we shipped it, and it's actually kind of funny. So they, first they paid for us to, to port it, then we ship it, and then they wanted to have it as a pre-installed game on, on Nokia Astound, which was like C7 or something was the model. But it was in the U.S. They were going to launch Nokia Astound, and they were thinking that it's going to sell like a million units, the phone. Um, and, and so they wanted it pre-installed on that phone, and and we worked hard on getting it, you know, for that. <laughs> and and uh, by my understanding, it, it was pre-installed. I never knew that it wasn't. I, I don't know, but like it was supposed to be pre-installed and 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 that phone. They end up selling basically nothing of that phone, and then they update the OS of that phone, and the game doesn't work anymore, and it's basically irreparable because they killed the sort of the whole framework the game was built on. So the game that was pre-installed basically in a couple of months after the launch stopped working. Uh, yeah, I think it sold like a thousand copies on the Nokia OV store. Yeah, it wasn't a great success on that platform. But then they had these calling innovators competition where they actually came out 20 million in prices and they had a lot of categories, and and so uh, Wood Labyrinth 3D ended up winning like the best uh, puzzle game category. So they was that specific, and by being the best in the <laughs> best puzzle game category, you still won a hundred thousand um, dollars. Yeah, so that happened. So in the end, Nokia paid like a hundred and thirty thousand for a game that had a thousand downloads on their app store Whew. yes well, that sounded was like a sweet deal for some yeah that's a that's a good 130 bucks for for every download 
You know, those people who got the game should be feeling pretty lucky that Nokia was willing to foot the bill. Now, I mean, it's obviously it's that's not the reason why Nokia was struggling, but but it was indicative of when you just have a lot of money but you can't get it right. It's 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 hard because um, sometimes you just can't buy your way out of like situations. Um, have you yeah. checked from the uh, eBay whether these are collector's items, you know? So maybe you can just, you know, <laughs> need get to buy Nokia. more than 130 bucks to get, you know, one nowadays pre-installed well, in the phone. Oof, that would be that would be terrific. Yeah, I don't know. Like, was it actually pre-installed? Because, like, I've never got in a phone. Um, it was it was very unstable, and it was it was just a god awful project. Um, but what's done is done and at least we got it working enough to get it on the store and and win the prize <laughs> Berti, i'm so sorry for you i we put you through hell you had your own moments of of sort of a terror and nightmare as well you did some updates and it didn't go exactly how how it was intended at least a few moments so maybe yeah just I, I just I, I i just uh, watched a, a video yesterday from tom scott who is this like makes YouTube videos about stuff, a lot of sort of tech related things, where he went through a case where he made a typo and destroyed like five thousand uh, documents f- from a website. And I was like, well, that's that's not really a bad thing. I mean, you lost like some days of work, but who cares? Because um, I've done a couple of updates that were comparatively. <laughs> scarier um these happens when you move fast uh, in terms of like wooden labyrinth 3d i once made an update that if you launch the game after the update and you had it installed before if you update in into this new update um it would crash and if you would open it again it would crash and you, you just couldn't get it running now usually what you would do is in this situation you remove the app and you download it again but even if that it would crash and you're like, well, how, how does that even happen? Well, because I stored data into a place that doesn't get wiped when you remove the app called the keychain. Um, and the bad data was in a position that you couldn't get rid of. The only way you really could get the app running again was to wipe your whole phone into sort of factory reset. <laughs> and then you get, get it running. Um, and that download was, a, that, that update was downloaded over a million times. So... Um, and back then, there was the, the the automatic update didn't exist. So, <laughs> a million people who chose to update their app. I don't know how many launched it, um, but I'm guessing a fair few. Now, yeah, it's 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 not good. Um, obviously, I could make an update that fixed all of this, but they have to update again, and then a week later that worked out. But it, you had that mo- moment of real, realization where, like, oh shit. Um, somewhat worse, perhaps, was that the case that I had with. But you learn from this, like you're like. After that, I've always tested um, all the updates, at least against the previous versions. I've always done tested some sort of update cycles, uh, where you know you first get the old version from the App Store, specifically from the App Store, not some your, some of your development versions. Nobody cares about those. You get the version from the App Store, and then get it running and then you install over it and see that it works you just make sure that happens okay um but with with gamebook which is um, a golf application that i i was developing at one point um if you know you're playing golf and after every hole or after every other hole or whatnot it would show you an ad the application what's fine is it's try to sell you some golf equipment or golf holidays and whatnot but so we had this um, special event that we were hosting for. I don't know if it was the editor, but it was a big chief in a, um, a Finnish tabloid newspaper. And um, so he was turning 50, I think, and he was hosting a, a golf event for his friends and, and some sort of business you know, connections and whatnot. And they wanted to have 
photos from his childhood all the way to his adulthood sort of sprinkled in as those ads. So we made a custom version of the application where we would have those sort of that ad package pre-bundled into the application where, you know, it would instead of the actual ads show these photos of, of him growing up. Um, the first one obviously was a baby picture. And in Finland, I don't know about other countries, we take a lot of baby pictures where babies are naked. Um, and so there he was, you know, full frontal, nice. And and it's it's cute and everything. And of course, if you're friends with the guy and, and you know him, it's not a big deal. At least in Finland, it's not a big deal. It's not like some CP bullshit. It's It was an innocent baby photo, but still, it's someone's baby photo. And then the next update on the App Store, you know, happens. And then we start getting sort of contacts so like and it was first like people who had actually been at the event or like so some of them was like okay I, I can still see these ads on my phone <laughs> you know and I'm like okay they must be you know they were at the event and so like it just hasn't updated and it's fine but then we start getting these questions from other people they're like what the hell are these ads yeah, and then you get that oh crap feeling, and 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 it turns out um, I had accidentally sort of bundled that set of ads into every copy of the of the app, and we had a few hundred thousand uh, updates go through with with these this gentleman's baby photos showing up, so. <laughs> Like I can't imagine the confusion of someone just just randomly downloading the app, starting to play golf, and you enter your result on the first hole, <laughs> and the screen turns and there's a naked baby, and you're like, "What the fuck did I just see and why?" Uh, yeah, so that that happened. I mean, it wasn't like everybody got it because like, usually it would get replaced by the active, uh, uh, like advertisement set. So it would download a set of new advertisements and it replace that. It would be the default one in case there were no active one. But um, if you had a, a slow con internet connection or it failed in Finland, a bunch of people still saw it. And we basically had no other markets at that point that had an active set. So everyone in like the US or the UK and like our big markets outside of Finland where we hadn't sold adver advertisements at that point Every user saw it. Um, so yeah, I don't know who the guy was. I could probably find out, but I'm, I'm very sorry to have published your photos. Um, yeah, obviously that was a grave mistake. And after that, what I learned is that I never do um, sort of configurations for... Um, there's a distribution configuration that goes to the app store that you never touch. And all of these, like these hacks and whatnot are in a different configuration that you never use for, for distributing to app store. So you sort of, your, your configuration management needs to be bulletproof in terms of you don't put test shit <laughs> on, on the app store. Um, and, um, yeah, since then I've, I've learned that. And, um, that particular one hasn't happened again. So, there's no, there's definitely no nude babies on on Vault. Do you have any advice for young people who are now listening to this podcast and and then they're like, okay, I I wanna you know, be next Elias. I wanna do Vault and I wanna you know do crazy things. So you know, how should I get started? Well, my personal uh, advice has always been that do not aim to be a billionaire. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I. I Although I'm a startup entrepreneur, I don't really like startups per se as a as a career path, because um, I think it's a very overhyped, oversold proposal. Um, so the thing is, it's very, very, very survivorship biased. It's 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 a sort of a pyramid scheme where you don't see 
the 95% of failures, we just don't talk about them. We only see those couple of few, you know, lucky breaks that happen to make it. Because I'm, I'm like, for example, Vault. I mean, there is so many places where it could have all gone wrong. It, you know, it could have not existed in the first place. And then we were close to sort of folding the company many times before we're in the current situation. And even then, like in the current situation, like Corona just happened to be uh, a, a sort of natural disaster kind of thing that wasn't terminal to Vault, but it easily could have been. Like there's a lot of startup cases that completely get destroyed by these like ha happenstance events that are outside your control. Like, um, so I would never sort of bet the farm on any single company. Because, like, and I, because you always hear these stories where, like, you you know, a guy triple mortgaged their house and and like and then made it, but you never hear the stories that are much more common where they triple mortgage their house and fail, and then they le live their life in misery because of that. Um, so like, ah, uh, like, I've always lived my life through sort of affordable loss risk taking. Um, I've never risked more in any game or any company that I, I can afford to lose. Um, so when we founded Quick, which is my first company, well, the only thing we risked was our time. Um, it was a consultancy company. We started selling our time and resources. We had our laptops. That was the only sort of upfront cost of it. And then we just started uh, developing and designing for, for our customers. And um, so we'd risk nothing. We never had a loan. Um, that we would be on the hook to pay ourselves. Um, the only time where I think where we could have gotten into problem was that we, when we uh, rented the office later, we had to agree to a sort of three-year lease. And potentially if we that day like sort of ran out of business, we, we would have to pay like a couple of hundred thousand. Obviously that wouldn't have happened. We would never have it. Like we were would have been covered by bankruptcy protection, I think, but like we never risked anything except our time and effort um, towards that company. And then only after uh, Quick was successful, after I had made my games again to those games, I never invested any money. Um, the only thing I invested was the hundred dollars for getting a, a developer license. And my mom was actually. <laughs> happy when, when Payazzo sold for over a hundred dollars my mom was like oh now you paid back your license i'm like oh mom i love you um by the way like five years into quick and and it had grown into like a three million revenue business my mom was like mm, you should probably still go back to college and have your degree done i'm like mom i'm, I'm gonna be fine um Finally, by the way, after Volt's sort of success, my mom is like, yeah, you probably don't need the, the degree because I, I never finished um, university. So, you know, I'm a horrible dropout. Um, but the point being, first of all, don't bet the farm because like, a lot of it is actually out of your control. No matter how good you are, how brilliant you are, I'm sure, you know, you we all – you have to be somewhat delusionally um, sure of your own skills and whatnot to be successful. So that's good. You know, you should have a little bit of that crazy self confidence because you're otherwise you're not going to be um, amounting to much. You know, you have to be delusional to be successful. But you know, don't 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 get overly cocky. You know, because it's in the end, it's it's a crapshoot. Um, and, and some people just like myself included have just gotten a bit too lucky. Um, and and so you can be good, but it's not the end. It's it's still not certain. Um, so don't bet the house. Um, and then just, I would start with the lower risk, pro, you know, company first. And then, you know, gamble with someone else's money. So I think the VC model is good where you, you don't fund it yourself completely. Yes, you're down, your upside is going to be capped because, well, then you're going to dilute the company. You own less and less of it. Um, but, you know, it's... It's not about becoming a billionaire. Uh, and some people are obsessed with, like, I I, I quit Vault um, at a time where I was pretty sure it was going to go quite well forward. But I was like, still, who am I kidding? 
this is enough. <laughs> um, and you just like don't um, because people people say this weird thing where it's like, oh, you know, you shoot for the moon and then you know even if you missile you land on the stars. Like no, um, it is not the case where they say like you know every company has like ninety five percent chance of failure, so might as well try a more valuable you know concept or harder one. No, like it's everyone who's ever built a billion dollar business has gotten an acquisition offer along the way it's it, that's what happens you like vault has gotten many acquisition offers we've turned down like at every stage of the the, the sort of growth we've turned down acquisition offers we could have sold the company but we choose not to um because we choose to explore further but at you know at every point you also take a new risk you also you know bet it all again and you say well no I want to see the next card. I want to see the next card. I want to see where this can go. And, you know, at some point, inevitably, all companies come to an end. So, you know, you just don't get obsessed with, with going too big, um, I I say. Because I've seen also cases where, you know, these we works and whatnot, you know. Of course, that that's high publicized case where it's like, yeah, this is worth 30 billion and the next week it's, worth five because <laughs> you get you just stretch a bit too far the vc business model um is that they can invest in tens of companies and they only have to see one or two successful ones and they the vc business model is successful but as an individual when you're putting a time and effort into a company you can you can make it maybe found three four companies in your lifetime um so you can't play it as risky as the VCs can because you cannot div diversify your portfolio uh, as effectively as they do. So if you only have three shots at success, if you're playing these like 10% or less than 10% chance of success cases, well, the chances are you're not, not going to be successful with any of them during your lifetime. But if you want to actually give yourself the opportunity to be successful, play it a bit more safe and don't trust the hype of, of going crazy all in. How do you define success? Yeah, that's the thing as well. Like, does it really matter the, the monetary side? Does it actually make you happy? I, I would wager to say very much no after a certain degree. Um, so when you're sort of safe in your life, um, uh, it, extra money doesn't make you happy. So, is money a successful a meter of success? Yes, it is to people, but it should it be? Mm, it's it's a tricky one. Um, now, my background is that because I'm a, I'm a I was a nerdy boy who went to school a year early, uh, so I was obviously bullied and whatnot. Then, what you want to do somewhat is is to sort of show to people that you are successful because you're yearning for that sort of social acceptance. So is that a meter of success? Yeah, sure. Um, in the end, I think it's uh, whatever you define yourself. Because, like, and then it's, well, is it happiness? Well, happiness is fleeting. Uh, and happiness is more sort of defined. So the long-term happiness is more defined of how you're built. Um, and you have, I feel you have very little control over it. Some people are just happy with it, whatever, and, and some people are miserable no matter what happens. You know, these sort of bumps of success where you're like, oh, I made an exit, or, oh, we got that funding round, or, you know, I got that award. They only last, you know, a week or half a year, or at most a year, and then you're like, well, this is my new baseline now. And and then one thing I learned from Mood Lambert 3D, actually, is that I, I now understand what it, what, why there are such a phenomenon as a sort of one hit wonders, and it has, I think it has very little to do with the fact that you know that they couldn't do another sort of hit thing. Like usually you have these musical acts that are one hit wonders, um, but I think the problem really lies in the fact that when you have a successful thing, it's very very daunting to even try again, because it's like the likelihood of you 
reaching the same success um, is low. And if you don't, uh, it's the same thing as, as having a down round in investment. If you have a down round in your life, your psyche is difficult because we sort of want to perceive our sort of career going upwards and upwards and upwards. But if you have a, a spike going upwards and then you have that crash down, you want to sort of protect yourself um, me mentally from it. So you don't even try uh, because you're afraid of what if I try and it's less successful than the previous one, um, then you're going to be devastated because sort of the, the sort of realization of that that the previous one was locked and and then you're it wasn't you're you're not all that good and, and so it's it's after Wooden Labyrinth 3D I really struggled um, to try again to sort of have the courage to go and have another go at the rodeo because I had some game concepts and it would have been a very fertile ground to sort of launch another game why didn't I do that I I attribute that to sort of the panic and, and terror of being successful that is that can be very um uh, sort of detrimental to your sort of um sort of chance of going at it again being successful it's very scary to to try after that what is your favorite word it's my favorite word it used to be i, I was trying to think of one um but i i i, I love the word epiphany uh, both for how it feels and for what it means. <laughs> what is your least favorite word? Competence. Like, man, uh, you, you could pick any of the the sort of uh, buzzwords from from tech and whatnot. Uh, I, I maybe even worse is is like agile, man. Uh, How about lean? No, <laughs> lean. Yeah. Um, or any sort of, oh, this, what is this? Uh, self oriented teams, whatever, man. Um, I'm not a big believer in, in, in the, the sort of modern ways of building software. I think it's a gross injustice that in this world we, we have brilliant software engineers for example in our teams and and then nowadays because because that's the sort of mantra they need to be able to make decisions um that i think they should be shielded from because you know if you're a brilliant software engineer i think that's enough and i think it's completely unfair and un un unethical to demand that you know basically anything about business or anything about design. I think you really, I mean, it's nice if you do. It's awesome. It's it's more more power to you. But the, the, the expectancy that we say, well, no, you know, the teams should decide themselves on, on what to build or, or how to build it. I think that puts all undue sort of um, load on, on people who just like, you know, this is my thing. Like, I, I build software. You tell me what to build and how to build it, and I, I, will, I will fucking deliver. And I think that's enough, son. Like, that's that's good and that's valuable. And and we put people in these situations nowadays where we're like, no, actually, you know, you need to decide what is, or, you know, what is, you know, important from the point of view of business. And it turns into a situation where then people assume that they should. And like, uh, this is something that I struggled with Walt at some points where I thought we should build something as a product lead. And then some team member would be like, no, I think we should do this. And I'm like, well, but but you don't know. <laughs> like, and um, so, and it's, then you have to sell it again. So I, I believe in a model where there's a benevolent dictator who kind of chooses for us, and then we can specialize in our own craft of of building to our hearts and content. And of course, like if there's trivial cases to make it better, that's fine. But we we shouldn't sort of democratize and and make it like all the decision making uh, across the board because I think that loses a lot of sort of the the brilliancy and the pureness of it it becomes a compromised mess if, if everybody gets to decide so yeah um, I'm, that's I have problems with that 
that reminds me of the case where you were sort of having a bit of fun with the vault and, and did a sort of a marketing game, which became probably successful, but also expensive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So back in the day when, it, obviously, as a co-founder, you get a, a sort of uh, somewhat levels of freedom in the company. No one questions what you do to a degree that a, a basic employee would. Um, so I built a, uh, an Easter egg game into Vault, which, which is found through the order tracking of the application. So while you're waiting for your food, if you tap the the sort of time estimate screen, um, it exposes this game where you tap the screen as many times as you can during five seconds, um, and then it gives you a record time and if you a record amount of taps. And if you beat that number, you get a one free delivery. You get it one per account, but you get a free delivery from playing a game that's hidden in, inside the application. I thought it was it, it was cool. The idea is that, well, first of all, you find this hidden gem inside the app, and that's like, oh my god, there's a game here? And so you play it, and that's kind of cool. And then it says, well, try to beat this record. And you're like, well, that's funny. And then you beat the record, and then you're like, you get a free delivery. So we sort of build up to this grand finale of where you actually get monetary value from beating a game and and then it offers you to share that on you know your social media platforms and we got there's thousands of shares uh so i think that's the, the marketing aspect of it um first of all you have to buy something to even play the game so it's not just you can just get free stuff no you have to buy something you get a free delivery for the next time so actually you have to make a second purchase so it makes some business sense the way it's built out and i think it's sort of two-tiered uh, sort of, oh my God, there's a f- game in here. Oh my God, it gave me a free delivery. I, it gives this nice um, sort of, it jumps the threshold of like, oh my God, this is cool. It's just not, not just happy fun times, but it's like there's a peak which should trigger you to share it. Now, so I launched that into the app and I checked it some years later and it turns out we had given out tens of thousands of these free deliveries. And um, I think nowadays we'd probably be around half a million euros worth of free deliveries given through this game. Which, mm, yeah, it's a, I made the game in like a week, but now uh, it has cost us half a million euros. So is that good or bad? <laughs> I don't know what you decide. Um, it's very hard to gauge sort of the effectiveness of that marketing. Um, but, but you cannot put a price on the waiting time, which make you which you make so delightful. Yeah, and it's oh, it's one of those effects. Um, it's funny, Wooden Labyrinth 3D, one of the, like, all the reviews, all the comments on App Store always mentioned that the coolest thing was that during the menus, the menus were built into the game in a way that it was happening on the same game board. So when you were tilting out around your phone, there was the ball rolling and you could, you know, bump into these buttons that were like wooden pegs in the board. And you were like, oh my God, this is so cool. You can like play the game during the, the, the menus. Well, it adds zero value to you. Like, why would you want to roll the ball around during the menus? But that was the thing that, that was like mentally a super important thing to other, like to people because it was so delightful. Um, and so... Like going overboard with delights. What's the reason to do that? You know, no, I, I made it because I think thought it was cool myself. I was like, well, it's actually cool that it's sort of self enclosed into this. It is, it was a fair bit of work to make it that way, but you know, I could have made a th- flat two D menu system and then go for the three D after the you start the game. But it was it was hard to do that way. But I think it was cool. Um, so I always wanted to have these like in terms of like when you make. Um, by the way, delightful was the word I was looking for. In my one of my favorite words these days. Um, so you want to change well, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, I just had an epiphany that that's actually the word I want to use. Um, no. So, um, when designing your solution, I, I think it's important that you're like you have these sort of grand moments of delight. Like you just because you need to break the sort of something being just good or just you know brilliant you, you don't want to have like something being like a nine out of ten all the time you'd rather be eight and a half and then a couple of tens in there 
Um, I think it's important that you hit those tens, that you hit those triggers at some points where it's like, oh my God, this is awesome. Um, Because that's the way you get the virality. Even if your menu system sucks, but your, you know, your face app turns you beautifully. Like some of these gimmicky effects that we've always had in, in apps that have gone viral. Most of the apps suck that have those, but they have that one magic little thing that drives you to it. So um, always go for magic. Um, but you don't have to be exceptional everywhere. Um, you, should, you know, I'm not saying you should make anything crap, but like like be solid, solid, solid good throughout and then be magical in places. I think that's the, that's the key. Um, so like, and then those like, less important places, like for example, involved the info screen of a restaurant. Well, who goes to an info screen of a restaurant? Well, nobody cares, but it has to be there so you can see the location and phone number when things go wrong. But that screen, for example, in the first version of Vault was um, the, the 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 Photoshop file. I took a screenshot out of it without the text boxes, and I pasted it into the app, and I just put text boxes on the screenshot. So if there was a restaurant name that was like too long to fit on a single row, Sucks to be you. It, it was just cut. <laughs> Everything was just like, it was literally built on top of an image of the view. I was like, who gives shit? Um, of course, if you like looked at it in, in, in different phone sizes, you could see that it was getting pixelated because it was stretching it. Whereas the other views, which were built with actual like list components and whatnot, it takes a little bit more time. Not that much, but at that point, we just wanted to ship the app. And nobody cares about an info page. So you can just fake it. Uh, and so fake it. <laughs> um, when it's not important, just completely fake that thing um, and, and put your effort into those magic moments. Yeah. What turns you on, creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Well, I'm really not a spiritual person. Um, I'm, I'm just creatively... <sighs> It's, and that's the problem with with getting big in a company. By the way, is my my answer to this is is that you lose the um, the manic parts where you basically build a whole service in a week. Uh, that's that really is is a massive mental cocaine to me. Is that rush of of you know working through the night and the day and that crunch in the beginning when you're creating something out of nothing and everything is, you have so much freedom you, you because you have so little sort of baggage from history, everything is moving fast and, and you just make magic happen. It's funny. I, I watched a video of that. I recorded from vault. Uh, that was two months after I had written the first line of code. And two months after Mika had drawn the first UI. And I was like, wow, that's <laughs> so close to the current product. I mean, sure, we have so many new features, so much. But but it was like, oh, the menu basically works the same way. Uh, and like, oh, we have these options here. And like, oh, I can choose the restaurant. Like, and that was two months. And then with one developer, one designer compared to now we have what? 130 combined and and six years it's that is to me like the 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 beginning is 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 where the interest is that is what turns you off yeah that the opposite of that right so <laughs> <laughs> so what is your favorite curse word <sighs> I would have to say it's Berkele. Um It's, yeah, though it's Finnish, but it, it's just... Yeah, we already have some Swedish yeah. ones as well, so... Yeah. I don't use it that often, but... Yeah, it, it gives you that. It gives you that, the good stuffs. Um, it helps. What sound or noise do you love? Wow. Um, what's... Well... Okay, I'm gonna cheap out on this one. It, it, it's got to be 
the baby laughters, man. Um, so I have now two baby girls. Well, not babies anymore. The other one is um, Alexa is two and a half years old and, and Eden is one and a half. But man, they they can have the most horrible sounds that they produce, but they also have the sweetest and the cutest and the loveliest. And, you know, is one funny aspect of, of not going to work daily is that I basically every day drop them up at the Green Garden and pick them up and the way they run to you and, and they're like, Iska, Iska, Iska. Woo. Um, yeah. If, if that's not the sweetest sound, I don't know what is. What sound or noise do you hate? Hmm. These are these are indeed tricky questions. Well, uh, I have to say, at this time of year, there's nothing quite aggravating as as birds chirping under your, you know, next to your window at four a.m. and you're trying to sleep, and they're like, you know. I'm sorry, you're not going to sleep because I'm horny. Come here, bird. Come here, bird. Um, yeah, because we're still currently living in a in a house where we we did install some cooling upstairs, but we're sleeping downstairs here, and it's hot. And then you have to have the window open, and then there's like a small patch of forest there, and man, birds be noisy. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Well, I've actually been, I would be interested in two different, very separate, very different professions. Uh, the other one is being a lawyer. Um, we figured out with my wife that I love being right, uh, like fundamentally right, more than sort of subjectively right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a common thing with, with software engineers. And that engineering mindset is that because there is, of course, that pure truth to a lot of things. Yeah, by not at least, which which is which is different from the sort of humane truth <laughs> and what is right <laughs> to a person and what is right um, from a sort of physics standpoint. So, uh, and I think one of the only professions outside of sort of development where you can sort of revel in your being right is is being a lawyer um i just read up on a case that happened last year in the u.s that really brought me joy in a sort of sadistic cathartic way of course i think it's completely horrible but i i had a vi i saw a video of it and i was like yeah i know where this is going and i think it's unfortunately correct <laughs> there's a case where in the u.s like um the police completely destroyed a person's house Uh, because uh, some like armed robber went in there and sort of bunkered down in his house. And the police came in and tore it to fucking pieces and exploded it to a point where they had to demolish the house. And the police said, well, you know, we're not going to pay anything for you. And yeah, and then it went to a very high court, not the, not, not, not the Supreme Court, but anyway, uh, I think it was the Court of Appeals or whatever. And... <laughs> And the argument, again, is sort of, did the government take away uh, the house? And I was like, no, they did not take it away. It's still there. It's just completely fucking wrecked. And yeah, they, they ruled. Because if they did take it away, uh, they would have to pay for it. But since they didn't take it away, uh, the police doesn't have to pay anything, by the way, in the U.S. If, they, if, if during the sort of, while solving crime, they can completely destroy whatever they want. Um, and they don't even have to sort of, sort of, limit their use of force because who cares if there's he didn't have any hostages he was just inside um but you know they can still completely demolish your house and say you know shitty luck try again next time hope you're insured um yeah a lawyer and the other one uh, i would be interested is is perhaps uh a watchmaker um but i don't know if i would have the patience for that but i i, I find mechanical watches to be very beautiful and uh, I think it's that's a very detail oriented thing and I love details in, in, in software so I like building watches would be uh, from the physical realm something that would be very very interesting 
What profession would you not like to do? Well, um, although I love my children, <laughs> it's funny. So now there's this Corona season, and of course we've been home a lot, and the kids haven't been at the kindergarten. And before that, uh, I was I was at home with my with my youngest for basically half a year. Um, what I've realized during that time is that I would be a horrible <laughs> kindergarten teacher. I, I've, I've actually been interested in being a teacher. But man, I, I just can't handle. And here's the thing, okay? What 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 having children is basically about? I I realized what it is. It's like, um, you know, you have you've seen this movie that it's a great movie, and you want to show it to your friend, right? So you it's like, here's the movie. Look at it. Kids is like that. But it's the whole life. It's not just the movie. You're the whole point is like you have these tiny little people that haven't experienced life and you get to show them everything, everything cool about it. Of course, they will learn everything bad about it as well, but you try not to show it to them. Um, but the problem is the same as with with um, the friend who watches the movie, which is that, or your wife, um, which is that they probably fall asleep during it and you're like, you know, f don't you appreciate me showing you this movie? This is fucking diamond. Um And that's what happened with with kids. I like, man, I wish they were a little bit quicker in learning. I mean, sure, they grow up like super fast, but still, I just don't have the patience for it. <laughs> like the the hundred and fiftieth time when they like stick like everything from the yard into their mouth, I'm like, man, um, it it, is, it has really grown my sort of patience. Um, I've never been a patient man. Uh, w with my work or with people at work as well. So I'm probably going to come out of it a better person. But like, yeah, I couldn't handle just doing it as a, as a job, man. Um, especially other people's kids, mm. especially more than two. Yeah, it's that. That's probably would be too much for me. If you could be a co-founder of any startup in any era, which one would you choose? Hmm. I logis uh, like logically, I think it would have to be Supercell. Um, like in terms of like it actually being successful, because that's nice. Um, and especially from the point of view, you build something that you actually get someone to use it. But that that's the real prize is getting your work out there and, and having people enjoy it. Because if if you spend a lot, if you pour your heart and soul into something and nobody uses it, it's kind of wasted. Um, so and also it, um, the the products themselves are really in tune with with what I with my physics building philosophy. The only thing I have a problem with with Supercell is the sort of free to play uh, model of the monetization that is sort of against my my core beliefs. So that's a, that's a problematic aspect of it. Um, though, like, of course, when, when Supercell was founded, that even wasn't a thing. Um, so maybe I could learn to live with that. I'm not sure, though. It's it's tricky for me personally. Um, I think it kind of ruined gaming um, for a lot of people, including myself. So... Yeah, but it's not their fault. It's just uh, it works too well, and it's impossible to not use it because. So it's like, can you blame people for using it if that's the only way to succeed? It's tricky. Um, so that is interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't really because you could say well, like a lot of the um, like American big companies, but you don't really know how it was in the beginning and how would you fit. So I, I think Supercell is, it's an interesting company, uh, very beautiful products. Thank you, Elias. This has been an amazing journey through a lot of different topics revolving around Vault. Hey, thanks a lot, Betty. It was a, it was a, it was a pleasure to chat. <laughs>